Hello, my name is Richard Rauch. I'm the president of the Carolinas Pain Institute and the Center for Clinical Research, as well as a clinical associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at Wake Forest University School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'd like to welcome you to this interactive exchange program, which has been designed to provide you with practical recommendations on using intrathecal therapies for patients with severe chronic pain. To begin today's program, I'm going to quickly review some potential advantages of intrathecal therapy as well as the mechanisms by which FDA-approved intrathecal analgesics achieve their effects. As we all know, under normal circumstances, the nociceptive system is activated when noxious stimuli are transduced into neural activity by receptors on sensory neurons near the site of stimulation. Signals generated in the periphery are then transmitted along peripheral neurons to the spinal cord. After entering the dorsal horn, the neural activity is transferred to secondary neurons and carried up the contralateral spinal cord. Impulses then enter the brain through the thalamus, which has connections with a number of brain regions, including areas involved in sensation, emotion, and stress. Together, the resulting activity in these and other areas creates the perception of pain. Neural activity originating in the peripheral and central nervous systems also modulates nociceptive signals as they move to the brain. For example, central facilitatory and inhibitory modulation is provided by spinal tracts descending from the brain stem to the dorsal horn. When working properly, the balance between the ascending and descending pathways allows us to recognize and appropriately respond to actual or potential harm. When pain becomes chronic, however, the central nervous system often becomes aberrantly sensitized, which is generally thought to reflect facilitated nociceptive activity in ascending tracts and reduced inhibitory activity in the descending modulatory system. For instance, Increased activity in the dorsal horn recruits low threshold mechanoreceptors that usually carry signals associated with touch. If these mechanoreceptors become switched on chronically, the increased activity in the dorsal horn can result in allodynia, defined as pain from a non-painful stimulus such as touch. Additionally, heightened release of neurotransmitters at connections between peripheral nociceptors and neurons in the spinal cord strengthen these synapses, causing increased sensitivity to noxious stimuli or hyperalgesia. When these and other pathologic processes result in ongoing pain that is severe and refractory to conventional medical management, delivering analgesics directly into the spine can provide certain advantages. In 1981, a publication authored by Burton Onofrio, Tony Aksh, and Philip Arnold reported substantial and sustained pain relief with an implanted pump delivering intrathecal, low-dose morphine in a patient with cancer-related pain. Since that time, pumps implanted into more than 300,000 patients have been used to provide medications intrathecally for a variety of indications, helping to establish this modality as a safe and effective method of drug delivery. In general, when a drug is delivered directly into the intrathecal space, lower daily doses are required to achieve the desired benefits. This usually translates into less systemic side effects compared with the same drug provided orally. Two analgesic agents have been approved for intrathecal use by the FDA. The first was morphine, an agonist of mu opioid receptors located throughout the body. Not surprisingly, when administered intrathecally, Morphine produces analgesia primarily via spinal effects, binding to mu receptors in the substantia gelatinosa of the spinal cord. These receptors are located both presynaptically and postsynaptically at the central connection between first-order nociceptors and second-order spinal neurons. Presynaptic receptor activation inhibits the release of the excitatory neurotransmitters whereas postsynaptic ligand binding hyperpolarizes the second-order neurons, reducing their responsiveness to excitatory inputs. The result is a dampening of incoming pain-related activity. Because morphine is relatively hydrophilic, 
It stays in the spinal fluid and moves with the pulsatile motion of the cerebrospinal fluid to spread rostrally to the brainstem and other higher brain areas. Intrathecal morphine also diffuses out of the intrathecal space slowly to enter the systemic circulation. This contributes to the adverse events associated with intrathecal morphine, including the most potentially catastrophic respiratory depression. All opioid agonists can cause respiratory depression, which are thought to occur when mu receptors are activated in the brain's respiratory centers, including in the brain stem. Note that because respiratory depression depends on morphine reaching supraspinal areas and cerebrospinal fluid movement is more pronounced in cervical regions, catheters placed at more rostral positions may increase the risk of this adverse outcome. The other medication approved by the FDA as an intrathecal analgesic is ziconotide, which is a synthetic version of the conotoxin peptide from the marine cone snail Conus magus. Based on studies in animal models, ziconotide is thought to exert its analgesic effects by selectively and reversibly antagonizing presynaptic, n-type, voltage-gated calcium channels expressed by primary afferent nociceptors. As action potentials arise from the periphery, blocking these channels prevents presynaptic calcium influx, an essential step in vesicle fusion and the release of pro-nociceptive neurotransmitters such as glutamate and substance P. Ziconotide is a large, hydrophilic molecule that does not diffuse out of the CSF and therefore likely does not reach the circulation at clinically relevant levels. However, ziconotide will move rostrally in the cerebrospinal fluid. Thus, ziconotide may reach supraspinal areas to block N-type voltage-gated calcium channels, which probably underlies its associated risk for neuropsychiatric adverse events, for example, hallucinations, cognitive issues, or nystagmus. Now that we have taken a brief look at the mechanisms thought to underlie some of the clinical effects of these intrathecal agents, let's return to a practical discussion on patient selection, treatment initiation, tailoring, and ongoing monitoring. Thank you for your time today, and enjoy the rest of the program.